Welcome to the Pod Circle Podcast, where we bring you practical tips and insights for every podcaster. From aspiring podcasters to experts with hundreds of episodes under your belt and everywhere in between, these conversations dive into the topics that matter most to you. Today, we are diving into your expertise, Kyle. We're going to be talking all about recording equipment. That is my wheelhouse for sure. Yes. And as we got into this topic, I realized there was probably too much knowledge that you hold for just one episode. So we are going to have part one and part two of these conversations. And part one is going to kind of walk through the basics of your initial setup and including a remote interview. And then the second part will really be diving into how to optimize both an in-person and a remote setup. So Yep. All the questions that come with this topic feel like probably the biggest barrier. I know that they were a huge barrier for me as I started podcasting. So, Kyle, how do you help clients overcome this barrier and even the fear that comes around this with the uncertainty? Yeah, I think a lot of people, have they hesitate to get started on their podcast because they feel like they need to be an expert in this or at least, mm -hmm. you know, be proficient. And it's just not the case. So at PodCircle, what I tell people all the time is that you don't need to know anything coming into it. That's kind of our job is to educate and to guide. Uh, that's I think that's really how I see myself in these types of situations is just as a yeah. guide to get a client from A, which if that means they knew nothing about gear, nothing about recording, to get them from A to Z, which is having a <laughs> fully formed podcast where they they feel really confident every time they sit down to record a podcast, that it's going to be captured really well. And then they send us really great raw material to edit yeah. and produce. So just to get started on that, I just let people know that they don't have to have it all figured out, that we have researched the best equipment for pretty much every podcasting scenario, where whether we're talking yeah. about in-person podcast recordings or remote podcast recordings like this, we're using Riverside, yeah. some folks use Zoom. And if they want to have a bit of a, a mix between both, a hybrid setup, we've got the right gear for those types of scenarios. Let's talk gear. Tell us about your favorite mic. Yeah. There's a mic called the Shure MV7 that came on the scene a couple of years ago. It's modeled after another really famous podcast mic called a Shure SM7B. Mm -hmm. The big difference with this one right here, and if you're watching this on YouTube, um, you can see... We can be Vanna White if you're watching on YouTube. Exactly. Hello. There it is. <laughs> Um, but this mic's great because it's a USB mic, so you can plug it mm -hmm. right into a computer, and it's truly plug and play. You actually just got your setup today, I did. Um, and you really just you plug it in, and it it just works, which is awesome. What's also great about it is that you can use it for in person mm -hmm. conversations. So sometimes in those cases, you actually will, will want to plug a mic cable into the back, run that into a recording device. But it's it's really a great hybrid mic. It's a it's just a great podcast mic in general. So it plugs straight into your computer. Um, yeah. It travels really well. Some of you might know that I live remote. I'm a digital nomad. My family and I have been traveling <laughs> for the past couple of years. I threw this thing in a in a bag in a box and in my kind of my go bag. So it works great for that. You can lock in your settings with it, which is really awesome. So if again, if you travel, if you're kind of moving around a lot. Mm -hmm. You can kind of dial in your microphone settings and then there's like two buttons on here. If you press them both at the same time for a few seconds, it'll lock in your settings so that they don't change. They don't get bumped. They don't get, they don't move, things like that. So I really, really like that as someone who's oftentimes training people on how to use gear, people that mm -hmm. aren't technically savvy, who aren't thinking about like, oh, is my mic level perfect for this so that I love the kind of set it and forget itness of that. I just did it in real time with you. I set exactly. I locked it in real time. It's so really, yeah. really easy. There's just like a slider. So you just slide your finger and it's more or less. It's pretty fantastic. I think it looks great on camera. You can put it on a little desktop mount. You can put it on a boom mount. It just works, which is what you want. You and I, we both use a, a little desktop stand here. Again, if you're on mm -hmm. YouTube, you can you can kind of see. It folds up. This This tripod here folds up really nice and easy. You can store it. Um, really easily. But if you want something that's a little more, that gives you a little more flexibility, you can get what's called a desk mounted or a table mounted boom stand. Mm -hmm. And it just clamps right under the edge and you can kind of swing it around wherever is most comfortable for you. And that's, that's a great solution if you just kind of have a static situation where, you know, you're not moving around, you're not changing locations a lot. That can just kind of be your podcast studio space. That tends to work really well. In fact, I'm considering getting one for my travels as well and because they actually fold up pretty 
pretty nice and easy too. So, so it just attaches to a table and you can easily move it around with you too. Exactly. And there's a few different kinds. Yeah. Some of them, they kind of telescope a little bit, um, mm -hmm. which means they sit up high. And some of them, they've started coming out with one, ones that are more low profile. So the, yeah. the, they kind of go across your desk and then just come straight up. I think both are great options. It's just a matter of preference. Great. I told you that I would be um, just the novice in this conversation. I think I used the word the dummy. But realistically, I think I want to ask the questions that we're all thinking because this is your expertise. So thank you for leading us through this gently. I really do appreciate it. Yeah. And I think just from an aesthetic standpoint, this mic looks very official. So if you're oh, yeah. looking for a mic that feels official and looks official... Every clip I see on Instagram, someone's using a sure mic in my mind. So totally, and they have uh, ones in white too, which are kind of nice. I've got a Ooh, few clients classy. that have the the white version. So, and I'm sure that they'll continue to come out with different colors. Awesome. Well, so we've got the mic locked in. We suggest this is the one you get because it works for both in person and virtual interviews and remote yeah. interviews. Yeah. What about headphones? I think a lot of times, originally, maybe. Four or five years ago, a podcast setup was very static. Everyone had the same like big headphones and, you yes. know, the official mics that were hardwired in and a lot of tech and all of that. What do you recommend now? Yeah. So basically, I break it down in, into basically three options. If you do want kind of the over the ear, the bigger headphones, you're going to get better sound quality with those, which is really nice. You're going to get better sound mm -hmm. isolation with those. The con is that they're more expensive than at least one of our other options. And that most people don't like how they show up on camera, uh, especially yeah. in a Zoom recording where you have a, or a Riverside recording in this case, where you have a camera right in front of you, they just mm -hmm. tend to be big, you know? Yeah. So a, a few alternatives to that are that you can just get really simple, cheap, $10 Sony in-ear, just earbuds, basically. I recommend that people plug them straight into their computer. And you can get them in any color, truly, like white, mm. black, different colors. They're just really minimalistic and they're very, very inexpensive. Yeah. A lot of people these days also have AirPods. You might notice that Mackenzie and I are both wearing our AirPods. Rocking the AirPods. They, yeah. I mean, you can barely even tell that they're in. They're just so minimalistic. They work great. Mm. I like that they're wireless. There's a lot of pros. And they sound, I've got the AirPod Pro headphones. So, you know, they're great. You can even go into noise cancellation mode if you kind of want to block out some background noise that yeah. might be distracting you. The cons are that they are the more expensive. They are the most expensive option. At least the pros are. I haven't priced out just the regular AirPods in a while. But um, the other thing to consider with those is that you need to make sure you have a full charge on them going into a mm -hmm. podcast recording. So that's just something to be mindful of. But if you have to ask my pick out of the three, it's for sure. It's for sure. AirPods. AirPods. I have been in a situation where my AirPods died in the middle of an interview um, mm -hmm. and I was using Riverside. And what you know about Riverside is that you have to signal like, hey, I'm wearing headphones when you start. So it kind of exactly. like throws it for a loop. You have to hop back out, hop back in. So make sure you're charged. But I will say I love the noise canceling on it. It's helped me in a lot of situations where I just want to like zone out and maybe my mic's not picking it up, but I'm, you know, getting distracted. So that helps. And I've had mine for three years and they still mm -hmm. work fantastic. So Same. it's a great investment and they continue to, in my mind, pay back. So Apple's not paying us, but if Apple wants to pay us, we would be willing to let them. Totally. Well, I use enough yeah. of their products, so, and have yes, for, exactly. for my entire career. <laughs> same, same. Uh, so let's talk about space. Um, yep. With the rise of remote interviews, I think a lot of people have shifted to just frankly recording in their homes. And yeah. so if you're on YouTube, you can see that we're both recording in our homes and you can actually, we're just going to call it out. I'm recording in my closet and behind yep. me, I have a curtain rod and a blanket over top of it so that you're not seeing my husband and I's messy closet and clothes. Um, you can get creative, but I think we care more about sound and aesthetics, but sound first. So tell us from a sound perspective what we need to be looking for in a space to record. Yeah, so just really quickly, my background before I was ever in podcasting was I was a record producer in Nashville. Yeah, I had a full production studio that I kind of hand designed. And so this is something I care a lot about. And also mm -hmm. I'm a pragmatist when it comes to it. So I, there's hills that I'm not willing to die on when it comes to when people ask me, do I need to go out and buy like really expensive sound absorption panels yeah. and all this stuff? I had all that stuff. If you're making music for a living in that kind of environment, that stuff's really important. For podcasting, I just, 
I think that small moves can make for big results. So I'm going to give some best practices around just the kind of room that you can can be in. So I kind of think about it in, in a couple of different ways. A room that has good sound. So I, I'm thinking bedrooms, office space in your house. Yeah. Bedrooms are good because oftentimes, sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. They're carpeted uh, or they have a rug. There's obviously a big yeah. bed in the room. Maybe there's a, a love seat or another piece of furniture. All of these things soak up sound. And that's exactly yeah. what you want. Um, some folks record in their in their closet. I have mixed feelings about that. Obviously, the sound is going to be good, but the vibe may not be so much, especially if it's a small closet. Now, if you have a large yeah. walk-in closet that maybe has a window in it, um, I don't mm -hmm. know how many of those have windows in them, but... I know that that's not normal, but that's what I currently have in front yeah. of me as a window. <laughs> oh, I think it's that might be ideal because you've got clothes and you know, you've got all that good stuff to soak up the sound. But you also want to record in a space that is inspiring to you that you actually look forward to recording yeah. in. I think that makes a big difference. But also you want to consider too your aesthetic, like what's in the background. Yeah. You want to think about things like lighting, especially if you're going to be recording video. I always encourage people to record video because even if they're not recording a video podcast, you want to be recording video for those social media assets where if you're like us and you pull clips for clients mm -hmm. and, you know, match them with the video, they just perform so well on on social media. So those are kind of a few of my high level tips in terms of deciding what an ideal recording space could be. Those are really great tips. And I'm even thinking like, how do I make it prettier in this space? Like, I love the idea of finding an aesthetic or finding a place that you feel excited to be in. Because yes. like I said, I've been recording remote podcasts for almost three years. And it's always been like a oh, okay, we have to find a space. Let me do that. And my company that I work for has created like an intentional space. And that has just changed the way I show up for podcasts too. So yes. if you're able to do that, if you've got a constant space that can be your podcasting space, there is a feeling that comes with that that's so encouraging. Totally. And whatever your space is, uh, and I'm, I have people that are starting out in mind. Yeah, You can totally. always change it, improve it, things like that. So don't, yeah. you know, you. I just don't think that you have to go out and spend a whole bunch of money and buy a neon sign that's in your back. Like maybe at some point, but yeah. just keep it simple. I think the, the majority of it is just some decent lighting. Maybe invest in a ring yeah. light and a neutral background. Um, I, mm -hmm. I've got a client who uses a, a really cool kind of shower curtain as her backdrop and it works. Yep. You know, is it the best thing in the world? No, but does it work for, <laughs> for her brand aesthetic? It totally does. Yeah. And at some point, I'm sure she'll upgrade, but I would deter people from being too perfectionistic about it. Yes. Uh, I think across the board, especially when it comes to launching something new, you're in those early iteration stages. I always say done at 90% is better than not done at 100%. Because I think so much, especially with launching a podcast, you can get in your head and you start to get nervous about it. And then you just don't do it because it's not perfect. So do it not perfectly. Yes. All right. Let's hit one more point about just those basic setups and the basic things that you need for every single podcast episode. And let's talk about camera. So we've already said we want you to be recording. We encourage you to be recording with absolutely every episode you do so that you can use it for other things, even if you don't have a video podcast, even if you're not putting it out on YouTube. Um, it's so great to be able to pull for social clips. But the best camera for your remote podcast interviews is your phone? Your yes, phone. Yes, your phone. That's, that's what I think. And I'm talking about what's attainable for people to get yeah. started. How do we get started? Yeah. Yes. Are there other nicer, more expensive cameras that you can spend over a thousand? Of course. And plenty yes. of folks have those. I'm trying to get people rocking and rolling with a setup that works and works well. Yeah. So these things can record in 4K. I think if you have, yeah. I know that mine's a, an iPhone 13 Pro. I know that it can. I'm not mm -hmm. sure how far back that goes. But even if you're not recording in 4K and you're recording in 1080p, yep. great. That's awesome. There's a couple of apps that make this possible. So on your iPhone, you'll, you'll download an app called Epic Cam. Um, I believe it's EPOC. C-A-M, and you'll want to download the pro version of that. I think it's like eight bucks, and I think it's a one-time yeah. fee. And that basically just turns your your phone into a webcam. You'll plug your phone into your computer. Um, that will power it and also uh, establish a connection. 
And then depending on whether you're Mac or PC, there is maybe a driver that you need to download Mm -hmm. to get that to work. It sounds complicated, but once you get it set up, it's really fantastic. And you can even adjust the color and the saturation if you want to even go to that level. But it looks really nice. I just trained a client on this on Friday and they couldn't believe the difference between their built-in webcam and what their phone was able to produce. And that's awesome. Yeah, it's it's really fantastic. Awesome. And so if you're recording video, you're going to need some kind of platform, right? Yes. So we love and use Riverside. We're currently using it. Um, yep. And I've been using it for like three years. And I really just, the biggest deterrent for me in doing remote interviews was technical glitches. And I always had trouble like asking the guests to do a backup recording on their end and getting that from them. And There was a lot of logistics that were hard to manage. And so once I discovered Riverside, I think you actually suggested it to me for the first time. I loved it because it's high quality audio and video that doesn't glitch when your Wi-Fi does. So for a few minutes ago, you glitched on me, but I knew you were going to come back because it's recording locally on your computer and then it uploads into that. And so let's say someone does lose service. It'll always come back and it'll record locally on your computer. And all you have to do is give them a simple little link and it'll record all their recordings and make sure it's stored there. And so it has saved me more than once. Um, And they're all stored right there in your Riverside platform. Yeah. And we just absolutely love it. Yeah, it's it's really great. And no system is perfect. Does Riverside have Mm -hmm. its quirks from time to time? Of course. Yes. Is it light years better than recording via Zoom? Yes, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Yes. The recording quality is is fantastic. And like you said, what you and I see on the screen here is basically Zoom call recording. So if the internet does get a little bit glitchy, I don't know if you noticed, but every time we start a new recording, it it says something to the effect of what you see on your screen is lower quality than what's being recorded in the background. Yeah, And it's cool too, because I can see up in the top, my recording speed is really fast. So 99% of my video and audio is already uploaded, which is fantastic. So you can kind of keep tabs on that. And there's another really great feature about Riverside where if you end an interview and then you end a recording and then your guest hops off before their recording is fully uploaded, all you have to do is send them a link. I think it's just riverside.fm slash upload. And then they can finish their recording. Good to go. You'll be able to see when that pops up. So they've really made great strides, I've noticed, in the past couple Mm -hmm. years to address some of these like common issues Uh, because there's a lot going on with Riverside. There's a lot of data transfer. And so they've just gotten really smart about how they handle bandwidth issues and things like that. So without getting into a whole lot of specifics there, all you need to know is that it records really high quality audio and video for each participant. So everything's Mm -hmm. separate, separate files for everybody. And then you can also have a computer a producer log in as a producer and then they can actually control people's volume. It's just really, really nice. It's it's they've done a really nice job with it and all they do is continue to improve on it. So we're really big fans of it. If you want to check Mm -hmm. it out, we actually have an affiliate link with them. So we get a small kickback, but um, I'm constantly turning people onto Riverside and and, and actually even training them on how to use it. Uh, And people seem to really enjoy it. And it houses everything, your downloads and everything. You don't have to transfer it over to Dropbox and share the files. You don't have to do any of that. It's all, it all exists within Riverside, so. Awesome. Well, Kyle, I think we've hit our time on this one. So we're gonna do a part two. (laughs) So if you've been fervishly taking notes in this episode, let me calm your nerves. We actually have already done the work for you. You can head to our show notes and get our complete podcast starter kit that has an entire equipment guide for you so that you can get access to everything we've talked about and get started on the right foot. All right, we'll see you back here for part two. All right, see you then. 